Hello and happy Sunday. It is April 26th, 2020. My name is Jim. I am a New York City-based saxophonist, composer, and educator, and I'm here to answer some of the questions uh, that I got over the internet and from some private students this week. Uh, hope you all are doing well and staying healthy. Okay, so first question is, how do you choose a good ligature and mouthpiece? So I have my giant pile of ligatures and mouthpieces here to show you all. Um, this is what I have <laughs> um, a lot. I've gone through a lot of different mouthpieces and ligatures over the years. And I think what I've what I've kind of found, um, what, what suits me the best, I guess, I'm trying to basically stay out of my own way uh, in choosing a ligature or a mouthpiece. So trying to kind of accentuate my natural sound um, instead of trying to alter it or change it using the mouthpiece ligature and read. There's a clip of Wynton Marcellus somewhere on the internet where he goes into a middle school and some student is talking about, you know, says basically, well, you know, you sound like that because you have that, you know, however, however many thousands of dollars worth of trumpet. Uh, and he picks up his horn and sounds exactly like Wynton. And uh, that's kind of what I think about when I think about uh, reeds and ligatures is something that's really open, allows the reed to vibrate and allows my natural sound to come through. Um, so if you're looking to pick out your own, think about this half of the instrument first and really making sure this is where you want it to be in terms of your, your armature um, support for your sound. Bring a friend when you go to the store and try out as many as you can and uh, you know see what works with you, see what sits well. One last piece, uh, the puzzle, which I, I guess I forgot about for years, which is make sure your setup, uh, you can very cleanly articulate with it. For a long time, I used kind of a too hard of a read and all my articulations got kind of fluffy. And that articulation is our introduction to your sound. So we want to make sure that's really crystal clear uh, when you when you play. Okay, next question. Uh, another one from Instagram, and it is tips on bebop phrasing and how do you suggest practicing bebop scales? This is a great question and it's kind of two different questions at once. So let's talk about phrasing first. When I think about bebop phrasing and practicing it, I go back to the Omni book. I go back to some of those famous Charlie Parker solos, especially the fast ones that are eighth note driven. Um, and I slow them way, way down. And I think about them in, in terms of 12, eight, right? So take Coco and you're playing it at and really working on your swing feel at that tempo. I think, you know, that's kind of where Charlie Parker is starting from. A very bluesy sort of sound, just sped up. Um, so take a look at that, thinking about continuing your air and moving it through all of your phrases. If you're, if you're a wind player, if you're not a wind player, connecting all those notes um, to make it sound smooth. Um, working on your triplet swing feel, even though Swing feel does straighten out when we speed up. I find it personally helpful for me to really have that really clear swing feel at that slower tempo. And then take a look at where he's accenting the notes. And depending on if you're doing your own transcriptions or if you're working from a transcription book, those may or may not be in there. Go in and and, and write in where he's articulating, what, what note of the bar or what notes of the bar have the most oomph to them. Usually, it's the highest note of the phrase is, is how he usually does it and how bebop normally works. But start there, start very slowly. Again, that slow 12 a time, that really helped me as I was kind of putting this together. The other part of the question is how do you practice bebop scales? Okay, so a bebop scale is a chord um, in scale form. We're putting chord tones on downbeats as we play. So if I'm playing in concert uh, F minor, right? Right, each one of those downbeats is a chord tone, and it the the resulting sound is. I'm outlining that chord as I play through the scale. That's kind of the idea of a bebop scale. So what I would suggest is use them as your chord scales. Um, what I have my students do is play the rhythm one and two and three and four over a bar, um, using your bebop scale. Now, if you're starting the bebop scale on, on one, you're gonna end up on seven. Um, and you're not getting that beboppiness sound, you're not getting that half step motion in your bebop scale. Start your chord scales on three 
and five and seven, ascending and descending. Um, and what, what that'll do is get you more comfortable with the sound of those bebop scales. The most important part of a bebop scale though is thinking about where it's resolving. So Hal Galper in his really great book, Forward Motion talks a ton about this. If you're, if you're more interested, I highly suggest picking it up. Um, the idea is thinking about where you're landing, not where you're starting, which is a lot of times how we are taught music and how we're taught scales is where is the scale starting? Think instead about where the scale is landing. This will lead you to enclosures. This will lead you into, um, you know, voice leading into the next bar um, and stuff like that. W one thing that I, I personally think is great is uh, playing a solo or playing, um, playing an exercise where you're just you're you're thinking about the and of four and one the and of four is a half step away from the chord tone that happens on one um you can kind of ramp this up in difficulty you can play it as you know basically a half note followed by a dotted quarter rest and then an eighth note think about it very simply um but you're working on where you're landing right so the better you get at this you can think about four and one and you're landing on one um or and four and one um so you're, you're trying to aim for that downbeat and uh, as Hal Galper says in his book, beat three as well. If you land on chord tones on beat one and three, you're gonna sound like you're playing the chord. So that's a really short explanation for a very difficult concept. Um, think about creating very short, very um, doable exercises for yourself as you work on that. Okay, next question comes in from one of my uh, private lesson students and he asked me, uh, how do you keep yourself motivated uh, in something like music that, you know, doesn't have an end result, doesn't have an end goal? And I think for me, this is where creating really smart and really clear goals for yourself uh, really comes into play. I'm thinking about goals on a couple of different levels. For example, I might be thinking about the goal for the week, what I want to finish this week, what I want to finish this month looking ahead what I want to finish this year or in the next five years. Um, so you, you, you're kind of building goal posts for yourself as you go, um, giving yourself things to work towards, even if it's not, you know, especially in this time, a lot of people, everybody's not in their band programs. Nobody has their final band concert to work towards. So how do you keep yourself motivated? Well, you got to make your own goals and set yourself up um, in a way that you can, in a way that's measurable, basically. Okay, next question comes in from Instagram. How do I play a meaningful solo? Good luck answering that. Yeah, that's that's a that's a heavy question. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer for you. Uh, I think that answer has to come from you, basically. So I have a lot. I mean, I'm sitting in the in the book corner today. Uh, I have a lot of books about um, meaning in music. One of them, or a couple that I would recommend, I guess is a Steven Nachmanovich free play. You can tell I've read it a few times, once or twice, um, as well as this more philosophical um, Leonard B. Meyer book, Emotion and Meaning in Music, um, which is extremely dense. <laughs> um, if, if you're looking for more of a philosophical answer, I think digging into some of that literature or looking at, um, you know, I have, I have John Coltrane's biography. Um, Herbie's autobiography is up here somewhere. Like, how are they... How are they talking about um, meaning in their in their music? It's it's a difficult question to answer because what you're getting at is what is instrumental music, and how do we denote uh, meaning from instrumental music? Uh, it's the most abstract art that there is that I'm aware of. Maybe dance uh, is on those same levels, but it doesn't have uh, an exact precise meaning. There's no way to tell you know somebody through your note choices to, you know, whatever, take out the trash or, you know, you're, you're going to get, you know, 75 cents back and change or something. That's not what music is for. That's not how it operates. Um, the short answer, if you're looking for that is you create your own meaning, right? Does the solo or, or does the piece of music that you're writing or working on, does it have meaning to you? And I think that's probably the best way to answer that question there's a lot of different ways to think about it, right? It might refer to something specific out in the world. It might not. Um, and if it has meaning for you, it might have meaning for somebody else. I think the trouble we run into is we're, some people, myself included, sometimes we'll play and write 
to try to try to create meaning for somebody else out in the world and not necessarily for them. And, you know, because of how music is communicated, the best thing that we can do is think about the meaning here and create music that we want to listen to. So that's it for this week. I hope you uh, I hope you're having a great week. I hope you're staying healthy uh, out there. I, um, trying out this new format. Let me know what you think. I'm going to put this up on YouTube instead of Instagram, but I will obviously link it to there. If you have questions that you want answered um, from me, I would happily take a crack at it. Otherwise, stay happy, stay healthy, and we will talk soon. Okay, bye.